I grew up in a suburb of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, it was a really idyllic place to grow up. Um, I grew up with a mom and a dad and an older sister. Um, it was a very, very loving home. My mom in particular was very nurturing and loving and I was incredibly close with her. Um, my dad traveled a lot for work. Uh, he and I weren't as close, but um, I had really a, a beautiful childhood um, up till about age 12. Um, and I felt like my mom really exemplified like a lot of things that I've tried to be as a mom myself. Um, but when I was 12, my dad uh, decided to leave my mom and um, it was very sudden. They didn't fight. Um, they had been a really uh, beautiful couple. My mom had been a model when she was younger. My dad uh, was a star pitcher in high school and I guess nobody really expected their marriage to end in divorce and me and my sister certainly didn't expect it either, but he, he left my mom, which was incredibly hard on her. She had been um, a stay-at-home mom uh, my whole childhood, and she suddenly found herself in the role of being a single mom. Um, shortly after he left, she had found an ad in the back of our local newspaper, a personal ad um, of a pastor who a self-proclaimed pastor who was looking for a godly wife. Um, and my family had not been particularly religious at all, but apparently this had been a sort of dream of my mom's to be a pastor's wife, to have a more religious uh, life. So she answered the ad um, and uh, very quickly got involved with this, again, um, self-styled pastor of a really small fundamentalist church, is what he called it, fundamentalist Christian church. Um, however, it was, it, was, it was not a church. It was really just a small-time cult um, and her involvement with him had immediate changes in our life. She uh, said she had been born again and uh, like immediately there were rules imposed on her that trickled down to me. Um, he, I had gone to public school. Um, he, you know, immediately demanded I be sent to a small Christian school. Um, as, as her time of dating him, which lasted five years from the time I was 12 to 17, went on, um, the rules would become more arbitrary, more um, have more to do with how you dressed, uh, who you talked to, uh, you couldn't celebrate holidays. Um, he was, he imposed these rules, her, her uh, boyfriend at the time, she would marry him when I was 17. He imposed these rules on her um, and I guess from my teenage years, I remember seeing my mom going from being a very vibrant and loving woman to a woman who was basically curled up in the corner of, a, of the couch every night in our living room crying because he had told her another way that she failed to live up to his standards or failed to be the godly woman he wanted. Um, meanwhile, I would learn many years later um, he was using drugs, uh, sleeping with his ex-wife, sleeping with multiple young women in the congregation, um, basically living a wild and degenerate life while imposing these really strict rules on 
um, his followers. It was a small group, and in particular on my mom. Um, and just the way he messed with her mind was devastating to see. And I felt like I was living in a nightmare. Um, she came very close to marrying him many times when I was a teen girl, but I felt like it was my responsibility to sort of save her from him. And I would, you know, cry and beg, you know, don't marry him. You know, we can, we can go back to how things were. We can live a normal life. Um, she, she was sucked in. She, he was a very charismatic person. He was very convincing. Um, and like I said, over my teen years, it, it progressed. It went from being a very strict fundamentalist Christian organization to, you know, dictating not only how women dressed, but how women styled their hair, um, what color pens you could use to write with, um, just really bizarre and arbitrary rules. He, he was a one-man show. He ran this little group the way he wanted. Um, a huge part of of his, his rules was requiring that his followers, the members of the church, um, would go out and street evangelize like all the time. And he would follow up on that. And you had to be doing that or you'd be kicked out of the church. So my mom, who was a single working mom who would work all day at a very boring, strenuous job to support me and um, my sister, uh, would also like four nights a week, like go out to um, either like our airport or in front of a shopping mall and um, hand out religious tracts. And like this was absolutely required. And she was very, very concerned with pleasing him and I was required to do this as well, which um, I was a very introverted child. So, and as a young teenage girl, especially, this was like beyond mortifying to have to go up to strangers and try to tell them why they were going to hell. Um, but if I didn't, my mom would be so like disappointed in me and, um, I wanted to please her, so I did this. Um, it was awful. It was embarrassing. Um, and it was exhausting, you know. It, and I, like I said, these requirements would just go up and up. Um, so... Um, like I said, I also tried to prevent her from marrying him a lot as a teenage girl. I can remember almost constantly like having a stomach ache or feeling sick to my stomach because of like the tension I was holding in. Um, another thing he required of his followers was to open their homes to others and like take in random people. So we often had people that we didn't really know like living in our suburban home um, and for a while there was a couple a married couple there and it was at a very intense time in my mom's relationship with this man and I I remember waking up one morning and the man from this couple standing over my bed yelling at me that I was the only one preventing my mom from entering this godly marriage and you know, shouldn't I, you know, I was a tool of the devil, basically. And if it wasn't for me, she'd be happily married to this man, uh, which was her like divine calling. And I just remember like the feeling again, as I was probably 15 or 16 in my little happy teen girl bedroom in the suburbs, you know, being yelled at. Uh, and I felt I was trying to save my mom. Um, I don't know, so much of my life, I feel like I just lived in a world where black was white and white was black. 
Um, and it's been a hard thing to unlearn. Um, so anyhow, from ages 12 to 17, on and off, she dated him. Um, and eventually he convinced her to marry him when I was 17. And by that time, going to a little uh, fundamentalist Christian school wasn't good enough anymore. I had to be pulled out my senior year of high school to be homeschooled. Um, and I was forced to take classes like how to be a submissive wife, um, you know, how to, how to keep a good home, um, and sit at a kitchen table with my mom for my senior year of high school, which felt absolutely ridiculous. Um, I also like had done very well in high school. Um, I, school came easily to me. I got A's. I would have been valedictorian of my tiny little Christian school class. Um, but again, I was pulled out for my senior year. Um, I, my academic claim, claim to fame is that I got an almost perfect score on my ACTs. Um, and even though I had no support at home, I could have gone to school anywhere I wanted. Um, like on the back of the ACTs, you could request that your transcripts be sent to different colleges. I just, I didn't have any hope. So I think I left that blank. But um, a couple of months after taking them, I actually got a letter from Oxford offering me um, a scholarship to come study English literature there. Um, and I remember taking that letter home and showing my mom, well, I guess I was at home, and showing my mom this letter. And she just looked at it like with kind of an empty face and just said like, why would you want to go there? Like, you, you just want to get married and have kids. Like, that's a woman's calling. You know, why would you want to go overseas? It's like she didn't even acknowledge the school or anything or the, the feat that it was. And I didn't tell anyone. I didn't have any, like, support outside of, of my family. I had a few friends, but they were kind of going on their own paths as well. Um, and I felt incredibly defeated and incredibly trapped. Um, so instead of going to Oxford, I went to like a community college um, just to like something to do while I tried to figure out like how to get out of the nightmare at home. And I, I tried to do well at this little college, but again, there were these evangelism requirements on me so I, um, I couldn't, I didn't have any time to do homework because I was required to go evangelize. And again, there was just scorn and disdain if I said, no, I need to stay home and like actually work on schoolwork. No, you need to just, you know, you need to go serve the Lord. And you know, you're so selfish. That was a refrain I would hear again and again. Um, so like, I had just about had it at this point. I was 18. I knew like I could leave. I just didn't really have a plan how to leave. Um, so one day, like I made up an excuse and said I was not feeling well, and they went to either evangelism or Bible study. And I packed up um, everything I had put it in my car and I called my dad who had not really been a part of my life as a teenager and just said, could I come stay with him? And uh, he said yes. And that was surprising to me. So I moved in with my dad for a little bit, but he was kind of living the bachelor life and I could tell he wasn't entirely comfortable with me living with him, um, although he was very kind. Um, so. When I was in high school, I had been part of this um, pen pal exchange program. Um, I had pen pals from a few different places in the world, um, including a male pen pal, a man from Israel. Um, and we had written for a number of years, and we had exchanged pictures, and 
he was a good looking man. Um, we, we flirted by letter. This was all pre-internet. Um, we eventually exchanged phone numbers and I remember I would drive to gas stations and sneak away and make these long distance calls to this, this man in Israel. Um, and somehow we came up with the plan that we wanted to meet. Um, he was Arab Israeli, so it was very hard for him to get a visa to the United States at the time. We ended up somehow putting together this plan to meet in Montreal, Quebec, um, which was kind of absurd. But we ended up, he flew there. I told my dad this plan, and my dad, um, loved me unconditionally and was sometimes more of a friend than a dad. Um, but he said, all right, if that's what you want to do, I'll take you to the airport. I hope it goes well. Um, so with really no experience of the world and having grown up incredibly sheltered, I got in an airplane and flew to Montreal and met my pen pal of a couple years. And um, I was 19 at the time, he was 19 as well, and um, I decided, you know, we were in love. Um, and I flew back once and like dropped out of college and withdrew all my money from the bank that I had earned with little jobs as a teenager and flew back to Montreal and we were going to fly back to Israel with the plan that we were going to marry each other. Um, when I lived with him in Montreal, we lived in a YMCA downtown Montreal. We had not a lot of money. Um, there were things that, that he would do that stood out to me that I kind of brushed off as cultural differences. You know, he was very, very jealous. Um, and I just thought, oh, you know, he, he's an Arab man. You know, they're, they're maybe a little more jealous. Um, but in retrospect, there were some, some tells that things were not going to go well. Um, but I was very infatuated. I was 19. I had big Indiana Jones fantasies, like I was going to go on this great adventure. And um, I had read a lot as a child a lot and I think I always kind of lived in a little bit of a fantasy world. I didn't know much about men in general at all. Um, and anyhow, we flew to Israel and he introduced me to his family as his friend and um, they were a Muslim family. So like boyfriend, girlfriend wasn't really accepted. Um, even though like, they kind of knew that we were, we had to be really careful in living with the family. And the people, we lived in a little village outside of Nazareth, Israel. Um, and the people were very, very hospitable, very warm, beautiful people. Um, his family, however, was very unkind to me. Um, they did not like the fact that he had brought an American woman there. Um, but I actually ended up living there three, excuse me, three or four months. We um, secretly went to a courthouse in Nazareth and got married. Um, I had to convert on paper to Islam because there's no civil marriage in Israel. Um, oh, I want to add one thing. When I was in Montreal, so I had you know, run away from home to go do this. Um, I spoke with my mom one time and she called me to tell me, um, you know, what are you doing? And she knew who this, this man was. And I said, I, I flew here to, to meet him and I'm in love. And she said, her comment to me was, well, Jill, I hope every single time you look in the mirror you're ashamed of who you are and what you're doing. And I don't know, that like stuck with me for a really long time. Um, so anyhow, um, we 
we were married um, and again it was it was a tense situation with his family um, but for the most part things were still okay um, however we like would have to go away from his family to be alone um, or be intimate and we would drive in his car um, to this um, olive orchard outside of a moshav or a communal farm in Israel, close to where he lived. And one night we drove out there, and I don't remember what the issue was at all, um, but he, he was really bad at me for something, some, some f minor fight. It might have been something I was wearing, I don't know. But um, it was the first time he was violent with me, and I remember we, we got out of the car, or he like pulled me out of the car, and if you've ever been in Israel at night, it's pitch black, and he, um, he, he hit me across the face, and he drove away, and I was miles from anything in the middle of pitch dark, um, a nighttime in an olive orchard in Israel. And I just remember thinking, like I felt so incredibly alone and like I had made a really big mistake. And, but now I was stuck because he was the only one I knew and I didn't know what to do. I just literally stood there, I don't even know how long. Um, and he eventually came back and got me, but like things cracked in my mind at that point, like my fantasy was no fantasy anymore. Um, then we, um, we wanted to come back to America. He wanted to build a life in America. So we flew back. Um, ironically, we ended up moving in with my mom and her husband. Um, there's a quote by Robert Frost that home is the place that when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Um, it was kind of that kind of a situation. Um, but when we got back to America, it was like something let loose in him. Um, and things got incredibly bad, incredibly fast. Um, we only lived a couple months with my mom before we got an apartment, but while we were there, um, we lived in the basement, he and I, and um, she had like a random teenage girl living there at the time. Like I said, they always took in people. Um, and one night we got in an argument in the basement and um, I still had some will left at this point, so there was you know, a little bit of yelling. And in my basement, like with my mom and her husband upstairs, like he hit me again, like in the, in the mouth or nose. And I remember like running up the stairs, you know, with blood and running into my mom and just like an ice cold response. This teen girl came over and she's like, did you hear what he did? You know, did you see what he did to my mom? And my mom looked at me and said, well, I heard you talking to him and you didn't sound very submissive. And like, again, this was just a moment in my mind where like something broke. And I have a teenage daughter. And I, I cannot imagine. Um, but she was totally under his, her husband's thrall. He, uh, she had essentially been brainwashed by him. And it was like no longer looking in my mom's eyes. It was like looking in, in vacant eyes. And it was, yeah, um, I knew there was no help to be found there anymore at all. So we moved out and uh, we had our own really small apartment and things got progressively worse very fast. Um, I worked, he worked, um, I worked at a hotel front desk and um, 
I think in a, abusive situations, it happened fast, but it also happens gradually where like you just kind of excuse things at first and try to make it seem normal in your mind. But um, for instance, he uh, would take my paychecks. I had no access to the money that I earned. And um, we were married for um, almost three years, but it, you know, it would be situations where I'd have to beg for money for personal care items. Um, he wouldn't give me money to buy groceries or food. Um, I worked at a hotel. They had a continental breakfast, and for like two years, I lived off that food. Like, and I think the manager there, I was a good employee and a hard worker, and the manager there knew it, and I think he felt sorry for me, and just kind of like, um, but I was also really proud, and I was really ashamed to admit that I had made a mistake in who I had chosen to be with. Um, and so I stayed quiet and pretended like everything was normal. Um, I also learned he was really a sadistic person. Um, he would come home from work and like the first thing he would do is like come sit next to me and hurt me. Um, and he was an, an idiot, so he would do things um, that wouldn't leave marks or be obvious. Um, like I have messed up toes because he would like twist things. Um, just really like painful little sadistic things. And like to try to get a reaction out of me and I would try to not react. And it was like this little sick game that he had. And he also started being really like verbally abusive I had had a boyfriend in high school, and he was obsessed with the fact that I wasn't a virgin when I married him. And he knew it, you know, before he married me, but every day in my face, you know, just, you're such a whore, you're such, you know, uh, this and that. Um, you're, so, you're so disgusting to me um, sexually. And this was like my newlywed husband, and I just couldn't, I didn't have a like a framework for that kind of like cruelty. Like I didn't know. I think I just dissociated a lot. Um, but um, he he occasionally would be more violent, and there were a few instances where I you know would have to cover up marks with makeup and things like that. Um, about six months into our marriage, um, I got pregnant. And I, I thought, you know, for sure this would change things. He would, you know, now I'm pregnant, now, now things will get better. Um, but he completely freaked out and he said, you know, you gotta, you gotta have an abortion right away. Like, and again, like I didn't have a framework for this kind of thought. Like, and I thought he was bluffing and I made the appointment and um, like it got to the day of the appointment and I, it was an early morning appointment and I remember him like shaking me awake saying, you know, get ready, we gotta go do this. And I was like, are you, are you serious? Like, I, you know, I still had thought at this point it wasn't really a real thing. And he got very violent that morning. Police actually came like so many women, I, you know, said nothing happened. We were just having an argument. Um, and yeah, he drove me there and in like a state of complete numbness, like I, I went through with it. And I remember the worker there like asking me, you know, did anyone, is anyone coercing you to do this? And I remember just looking at them, you know, with just like dead eyes and just saying no. And it was like an out of body experience. And like I said, he was very financially abusive. So I never had money for things. 
like birth control, like um, healthcare, um, basic human needs. And um, this would become a pattern over the course of our marriage. Um, also, like he, he said I was so like disgusting that he like wouldn't ever normally initiate sexual things with me. Um, he would wait until I fell asleep and then basically rape me, wake me up by raping me really brutally, really, really violently. And it led to, I was afraid to fall asleep. So I was like in a constant state of exhaustion. Um, it made it really hard to work. Um, and again, like these little sadistic things he would do to my body would kind of be his appetizer and turn him on. But it's like he couldn't admit he actually wanted me sexually, so he had to wait until I fell asleep to do these things. And that created problems throughout my life. Um, but over the course of the marriage, there were the pregnancy and abortion situation was played out a lot of times. Um, like I can't clearly remember a lot of it. Like my brain just shut down um, around that. But um, it was, yeah, it was a devastating thing. And the more it went on, the more I became obsessed with wanting a child. <laughs> and like that would provide some sense of magical relief. Anyhow, um, I was working at this hotel. I read a lot while I was there. It was a new hotel, um, so it was very dead, and, like no, not a lot of customers. Um, and like, I, I just, I don't know, like reading books about other people's lives and suffering like somehow like saved my mind during that time like made me feel because i was very isolated and it made me feel less so there was one friend who checked on me a few times um a boy i had gone to high school with he was um he was a senior when i was a freshman but we were we were good friends and he would occasionally check on me although if he checked on me by calling me when I was at home, all hell would break loose with my, my husband. He showed up at my work at the hotel once. He found out where I worked from my mom, I think. And he knew something was wrong. And somehow I got the courage to like meet him for a lunch and I confided in him a little bit of what was going on at home. I couldn't even express close to all of what it was. But he, he basically said, I'm getting you out of there. Um, and he and my dad, again, like I didn't tell my dad any of this. My dad had no idea what was going on. I, I didn't talk to anyone. When you're in this kind of situation, at least for me, like I just stopped talking to people, friends, everyone. Um, but anyhow, um, through this friend's support and help, uh, he and his buddy and my dad came to the little hellish apartment that I lived in right after my husband had gone to work and in about an hour packed up my very few belongings and drove me, I got an apartment right by where my, my dad lived. Um, and I never, I never looked back. Um, and I filed for divorce. Um, and I make this sound like a, a an easy process, but I should say like I was I was in such bad like shape psychologically when I left him 
that I remember like I couldn't I couldn't talk to someone in a store. I couldn't order a coffee. I couldn't order food. I was wrecked. I was just completely wrecked. Um, I actually had like a huge uh, like autoimmune flare up where like I couldn't walk for a few months. I was like 21 and like I, I couldn't walk. I had to use a walker. Like they couldn't ever really explain to me what was going on with my body, but I think it was just a complete stress response. Um, anyhow, so I got out of there. So when I left um, my first husband, he knew that my mom's cult religion did not believe in divorce. Um, and he knew he would find um, sympathy there. He was a, a very conniving person. And he went to my mom and had this sob story of your daughter left me, you know, and, you know, I don't know why. And um, she took him in and he actually moved back in with them. And she would, my mom would show up with him at our court hearings, um, both of them carrying Bibles because he had now converted to Christianity. And not only that, but after our divorce was done, my mom um, like helped him basically choose a, a new wife, which was another young lady that was involved in, in the cult. Um, and yeah. Um, I did my mom's home at that time as well. Like I was told, I don't think I saw it, but like my senior picture was taken down from the wall and that girl's picture was put up. That was like her new, her new daughter. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, so this friend who had moved me out was kind to me and to me represented safety and he um, came from what I thought was a really solid Christian family and like a few months later I I was marrying him <laughs> and like you know I didn't know anything so I thought he was young too um, I hadn't Like I was in no shape to get married, <laughs> clearly. Um, our first year of marriage was incredibly rough. I would cry every single day. He didn't know what to do, you know, or why. Um, but um, yeah, like it, it, he still represented safety and he did the best he could um, as a man in his young 20s, I think. He also came from a fundamentalist Christian background um, and things were better in a way, um, but I was still holding on to this like paradigm that, that you know, this, this fundamentalist interpretation of Christianity was the right way and anything that, that veered away from that was wrong. Um, and like coming out of an abusive, an incredibly abusive marriage and situation and still like having, you know, we were church going, still having those, those beliefs somewhat watered down. It wasn't as extreme as the cult my mom was in, but, you know, still being told, you know, a woman's role is to be submissive and to be quiet and this and that like I can't explain how profoundly damaging that is to someone who comes from any type of abuse and um, the other thing like the good Christian people that I would talk to basically told me basically my whole life to be quiet about this you know like don't talk about it just pretend it didn't happen in particularly in particular around the abortions I had been forced to have like I was 
I bore so much guilt over that and so much shame. Um, like I was scared to mention that around good Christian ladies because like just that's like the unforgivable sin. Um, it was, so I held a lot inside and again, like I wanted to have a child and a year into our marriage, I did. I like my body had been through so much that like a doctor had actually told me I probably could not get pregnant, but I did. And I, I had my oldest son and I was lost in a world of love for him. It was, I completely threw myself into being a mom. I had three children in my 20s, um, and I wanted to live out this this good life, this good Christian life. Um, so, like, I actually homeschooled my kids till they were in fifth or sixth grade, which was actually a beautiful experience. I, I love teaching my kids. Um, they were my world. I would take them places every single day, but there was always like this, this void and this like darkness in me that I felt like I didn't fit anywhere because of things that had happened in the past. I think as my children got older, um, I was, I had more time with myself. Um, I was a stay at home mom and uh, as they're teenagers and start to need you less, I think a lot of these repressed trauma issues really like were starting to come to the surface. Um, and uh, my husband and I had grown apart. He was really involved in his business. Um, and after um, like 17 years of marriage, I. I was dreading him coming home and I didn't want to feel that way. I didn't want that to be my life. Um, so I made the decision to leave the marriage. Um, ends of marriages aren't pretty. Um, and it was particularly difficult. We never had a lot of money or financial resources. I hadn't worked since I was like, a teenager or a very young adult, um, but I, I worked three jobs to save money to move out because I knew that if I didn't leave the marriage, it would never end. And it was an incredibly difficult decision. But I moved out and um, I, I worked and I found love and I um, I started to meet good people that when I told them certain parts of this story didn't judge me and didn't didn't condemn me and listened and understood and like that a handful of good friends that came into my life like in the last four years were transformative to me like in getting my mind out of this paradigm that I was still somehow breaking all these laws of God by having a voice by speaking um, I had a friend tell me you know when I told them some things about my past you know why don't you try going to school like why don't you it's not too late you could try that so like I um, enrolled in college and I, I'm still a full-time student. I got to go to school, um, but like it wasn't easy. Like I still struggle with like practical things sometimes, but um, yeah. So I was going to school, I had just uh, made a transition to get an apartment big enough so that my kids could come stay with me sometimes, which was a really big deal. Um, and things were going fairly well for me. Um, and then 
suddenly my dad died. He uh, had likely a sudden heart attack. Um, and this happened in late 2019. And my dad and I, over my adult life, had gotten closer and closer. He was my support system. He was my go-to. He was really the only embodiment of like unconditional love that I ever had. Um, and uh, I had always made a joke that if my dad ever dies, I'm gonna lose my mind. Um, what I didn't expect to happen was I actually had that happen. Um, so he, he died and I became extremely depressed. I started to struggle with schoolwork. Um, I quit my job. Um, I was, you know, in a relationship that was a little uncertain and I, I became more and more depressed, but like over the course of a week, uh, this was a few months after he died, the depression turned to like extreme paranoia. And like all of a sudden, I was having these like paranoid thoughts that, you know, um, people could see my thoughts, people could see um, what I was writing. I've written all my life and I've often, like I, I journal and I've often felt, well, my mom once found my journal and like just totally shamed me for everything I wrote. And like, I've often felt really like ashamed of what I write. Um, but anyhow, like I, I had these like paranoid delusional thoughts. And then like in the course of a night, uh, it turned on, it, it like I went, into a different world. I stepped out of this world into a delusional world. And um, friends were you know, incredibly concerned about me. I wouldn't go back to my apartment. I thought my apartment was being watched all the time. I accused f loved ones and friends of you know, terrible things. Um, I thought my children were not really my children. The delusions became more profound over time. Um, I lived in my car for a little while. Um, but the culmination of that, I eventually um, got a studio apartment with nothing on the walls, just like a white studio apartment. I unpacked nothing there. I had like a bare mattress. Language and words like all seemed really menacing to me. Um, so I just wanted nothing. I wanted blankness. Um, and I completely like stopped talking to everyone. Um, I think kids and family assumed I was on drugs, um, which I wasn't. And I would spend like 15 hours a day standing in that apartment, staring at the wall because I thought I had to. When you're delusional, you don't know you're delusional. It's really hard to explain. Um, but my biggest delusions were that I was going to go blind and that everyone was like part of a hive mind except me. So in order to keep my sight, I had to stand and stare at this wall. Um, and like I wouldn't even allow myself to sit and like all these rules came up. My whole life, like I think had been trying to follow rules and then like when I lost my mind for this period it was like I enacted all these severe rules on myself um so like yeah I'd stand I didn't think I was allowed to eat I stopped eating um I went like 28 days at one point without eating I um I would go four or five days without drinking and then just barely take sips of water. Um, I lost like almost a third of my body weight. I was emaciated. Um, and again, like I wasn't talking to anyone, nobody knew. And I eventually became so afraid that I was going to go blind that I was afraid of going blind in this apartment alone. I wanted to see my kids' faces one more time, even though I didn't really believe they were 
my kids. Um, I just wanted to see their faces. So um, the psychosis like culminated, like maybe the worst experience during that time was I set out walking one night like in, in my city in Milwaukee and um, I was being talked to by, I guess you could say voices, cars were talking to me and telling me to do things. Um, I remember like g being given challenges to like walk backwards into traffic um, with my eyes shut. Um, and like the goal was to get hit so I could die and like end this. Um, but it was like, it was weird because I guess in a sense I was suicidal, but it was more like delusionally based and like a game almost. Um, I walked for like 13 hours one night that night and again and again doing these challenges. I think I caused like a minor car accident one time. It, it was it was really bad. Um, but like as as daylight broke, the like last challenge because I wasn't I wasn't killing myself was climb a fence to the freeway and get down there and do it there because that'll work. Um, and so like severely emaciated and severely delusional, like I, um, like at seven in the morning, climbed this fence and like I was really weak. So it was really hard to get over this chain link fence. Um, but these two women, uh, mother and daughter, uh, pulled up and saw me and it was like 30 degrees out. I had a sopping wet winter coat because it was also raining. And they held on to the edge of that coat and called the police. Um, and I fought them. And um, like they basically saved my life. Um, and I don't know, that was, I think the thing that I learned going through that time was like for me, I think that psychosis was my way of dealing with a lifetime of, or my mind's way of dealing with a lifetime of like suppressed trauma. Um, it's also like interesting, and I know like when you when you present as crazy to the world, when you're a silent, emaciated, dirty, because I also didn't think I was allowed to wash like women walking the streets, people don't see you. People pre pretend you're not there. Um, and um, it's interesting because I had such kind people like that pull me down from, from the fence, but like I was taken to the ER, of course. And I remember I was silent and non-responsive and very stiff and they had to like cut my clothes off. And I remember like the ER nurses like talking about me like I wasn't there, like laughing at like how my, how dirty I was and my body. And it's just like, I wish people could know that like people who are crazy still can hear you. They're still people, they still know what you're saying. I never lost my intelligence, but I had people talk to me like, you know, like I was profoundly mentally disabled. Um, and yeah, like people just don't see you on the, on the bus, you know. Oh, another thing, like when during this time of psychosis, I had been, you know, I had been abused through food, so I starved myself. Um, I had been abused financially, so the like little money I had, like to live off of, I gave away to anyone and everyone. Like I, I sold my car. <laughs> um, like, I didn't think I was allowed to have a car. I thought I was supposed to walk everywhere. I don't know, the, the human mind is just really interesting to me. Um, it's like all the things I had suffered, I like did to myself worse. It's hard to explain. Um, but um, like as quickly as that came on and as long as it lasted, um, 
it went away. Um, and through like the love of a few people and support and like some basic kindness, I came out of that and um, obviously like it caused a lot of damage in my life that I'm still trying to repair. But I think the, the main thing I've learned is like real love doesn't have conditions on it. Real love doesn't require adherence to rules. And like that was something I had to like deprogram from my whole life and still am. Hmm. All right, Jill, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. Good luck with everything. Thanks. Thank you.